Uh, we have we have joining us right now one of the co-hosts of Warty NHL. He's coming from us from across coming to us from across the pond, and he's a man who said one of my favorite quotes: "The Minnesota Wild are the side salad of the NHL." <laughs> this is Scott Boyce is with us. Um, how you doing, Steve? Yeah, I'm I'm doing good actually. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's been a crazy week, you know. Uh, recorded with Tyler yesterday. Recorded yep, with you guys. Today. Um, expansion draft tomorrow. I'm getting vaccinated on Thursday. Entry draft draft on Friday. So it's uh, yeah, I got interesting week. Let's go. Oh, um. So I guess I guess I gotta address one of the elephants in the room that people are talking about. We're gonna be talking about this in our broad talk segment as well soon. But uh, NP22, first time on the show, so welcome to us. Uh, he asked, uh, "Who else is excited for Jack Eichel to be a New York Ranger soon? What do you think of the chances of that happening?" Um, a couple of weeks ago, I would have said the chances are slim because Buffalo just wanted too much for him. Um, and now that uh, Elliot Friedman earlier today said that the Anaheim Ducks and the LA Kings are out and Calgary Flames for whatever reason they were in, they're out. Um, so we're left with the Minnesota Wild and the New York Rangers. And I think this makes it easier for the Rangers to acquire him for a price that Drury wants to pay and not the price that Buffalo initially wanted. Um, when there were talks about Anaheim and LA, you're going to have to think that Anaheim and LA are out because they don't want to give up Jamie Drysdale, Trevor Zegras, uh, uh, Alex Turcotte, and Quinton Byfield. If those players are not available from other teams, then I'm 100% sure that Kako and Lafreniere are not going to be available. And honestly, I would even be shocked if Kravtsov and Lundqvist are part of the equation. Um, and as John knows, the, the package I've been shouting from the rooftops for the last few weeks, or months maybe, Rick Nash... Philip Heedle, Matthew Robertson, first round pick. I think that's a fair return for Jack Eichel, for what he brings, for what you get out of Jack Eichel. Um, and I've compared the package to the Rick Nash trade. And I know a lot of people say, yes, he's a center. And yes, he's only 24 years old. The age, I think, is not that relevant because you get five years of Jack Eichel in this trade. Whereas in 2012, the Rangers got six years out of Rick Nash. So I think that that's pretty much even. Um, but the injury, I think, offsets the fact that Eichel is a better player. You know, the injury is a concern. It lowers the price. Um, and if Buffalo is willing to lower their price to the point where Drury is comfortable making that trade, I could see it happen. Um, and, of course, there's rumors about Stroh maybe being traded to Ottawa, and it makes a lot more sense if a Jack Eichel trade is in the books that Rome is being traded to Ottawa. Because if I look at the Ottawa Senators, they don't have anything that I want from the Ottawa Senators aside from the players that are untouchable. Or do you want to trade Ryan Strome for Shane Pinto? Uh, uh, I mean, good prospect, but that's not the direction Dolan wants to go. Um, so you're looking for established players and then you end up with Connor Brown or Colin White. And in that case, I would just stick with Ryan Strome. But if you're acquiring Jack Eichel in a different trade from the Buffalo Sabres, now you have Strom to maybe recoup some assets. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, a trade for futures makes sense because you need to restock the, you know, the prospect pool a little bit. Um, my, my dream would be to trade Ryan Strom for a first round pick next year, maybe, maybe top five protected or whatever. <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure the Ottawa Senators won't do it, but... Yeah, a lot of things are going to happen now, you know. Um, Barclay Goudreau is almost going to sign. Uh, probably going to lose Colin Blackwell or Julian Gauthier. Or, whatever. Uh, yeah, and um, interesting to see what Drury is going to do the rest of the offseason. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It, it's, I, I've, I've, you know, as you mentioned before, I've met that Rick Nash comparison. And honestly, it was funny because... You were the first person I thought of when that whole bit about the, you know, the lowering of the price came out because he basically described the Nash trade to a T. You know, the two roster players, and you look at it, it's one of either Pablo Buchnevich or I think Buffalo will probably value Pablo Buchnevich more, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you know, Philip Heedle would be the other roster player, the first-round pick, and then one of your choice of maybe... 
I don't know, Matthew Robertson or Zach Jones. And yeah. I know you're a big fan of Jones. I can see the Jones jersey on the wall. I love that jersey. It's sick. But, you know, if, if that gets you Jack Eichel, you've got to pull the trigger on that deal. Yeah. You can't pass that up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 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 my 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 issue was never with acquiring Jack Eichel. My issue was giving up future core players for a player who is suffering a serious neck injury and and once out of Buffalo. You know, I'm okay with trading for Jack Eichel. I just didn't want to give up Capo, Capo Caco, Alexi Lafreniere, and to a degree, not even Vitali Kravtsov and Nils Lundqvist, because I think those prospects are on the same level as Trevor Zegras, Jamie Drysdale, Alex Turco. Uh, and if Anaheim and LA are not giving them up, why should we? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, 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 and you know what? It, the funny part is, is that I think Nils Lundqvist has surpassed all of them. I think he's the team's top prospect right now at this point. I, 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 I honestly, look. I, to, listen, two years ago, I made a ranking uh, where I had Niels Lundqvist ahead of Kraftsoff and Miller, and people called me crazy. Um, I, I stick by it. You know, Niels Lundqvist does things that that other prospects don't do. I like Miller. I like Kraftsoff. You know, uh, I'm really happy with the prospect pool we have. But what Niels Lundqvist has done, especially the last two years. And I'm not even talking about the SHL. I'm talking about how he plays for the men's national team at age 19 and age 20. And he's he's an alternate captain for the men's national team. And at the World Championships, until he got injured, he was by far their best player. And this is this is the Swedish national team. This is not under 20. This is not under 18. It's a Swedish men's national team that always have, well, unless they play in the NHL playoffs, the best Swedish players. The team that won the World Championship in 2017 with Henrik Lundqvist in that, when it was in Germany and France, that same team Nils Lundqvist played for. And he played a game against Russia where uh, Kravtsov was playing as well. He played 28 minutes that game. 28 minutes on defense, being an alternate captain at age 20 for the national team. That's insane. Wow. That, that's just ridiculous. And yeah, he's 5'11". So what? So was Anton Stroman. We never hear that argument against them. Nope. And uh, look, it came up yesterday when I was recording with Tyler, and I'm getting sick and tired of people complaining that, oh, no, he's too small, this and that. I don't care. You know, uh, Braden McNabb was schooled by Cole Caulfield. Braden McNabb is a big defenseman, but he's a slow defenseman. I don't care about size. I care about you being a good defenseman. And I said this last night. The reason Tampa Bay won the Cup it's not because Sergachev and Cernak and McDonough and Hetman are 6-3, 6-4. Tampa Bay won the cup because those four guys are really good defensemen. Here, here's the one thing you can always point to, and I, I always do so because, you know, as someone who's played defense for a long time, Anthony, you've played with me. You know I, I, I played wing. You know I play defense. But the one thing that I will always point to in terms of defense is Nicholas Lid. Because there's never been anybody that's played the gaps better, that has been better with body positioning, and has shown players that you can outwork a guy like Eric Lindros, 6'5", 230 pounds, built like a tank, just by being smart with your body and getting the proper positioning on a forward like that. Nicholas Lindstrom is always the guy that I point to, and if you want a more modern-day example of it, Adam Fox. Adam Fox. Yeah. Plays the body positioning game so well. He gets the puck away from bigger forwards. He strips it and then he cuts through two guys and he makes that play. And you know what the yep. scary thing is about Mills Lundquist? If you ask me from everything that I've watched, everything that I've seen, the footage, the games, live games that I've watched of him, he's a better skater than Adam Fox is. Now, uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll quickly chime in on that. Yes, um, I think. People look at Nils Lundqvist and they look at the highlight reel and they see the goals on the power play, which is fascinating. Yeah. The way he shoots, yes, fascinating. He has this, like, the quick release that Duncan Keith has from the blue line. That's probably the player I would compare him to on the power play. But that's not, that's not his biggest strength. I would put that maybe fourth or fifth. Um, his lateral movement is amazing. His back control is probably the best in the Swedish league. And it's going to be on par in the NHL. But what stands out to me, and as as you know, John, we spoke we spoke about this. 
I try to, well, not with COVID, but before COVID, I would fly to Sweden, fly to Finland, you know, Russia, attend games. I want to be close to the action, but I don't just want to watch the game. I want to watch players when they come back to the bench. How does a player react to a good shift or a bad shift? I've, I've seen guys like Kotkaniemi, Rantanen, in the Swedish league at age 17, 18. I was watching how they responded to their team conceding a goal, uh, having a bad shift, a teammate having a bad shift. I did sing with Lundqvist, and Lundqvist never sits down. He always leans over the boards. Lundqvist, when he's on the bench, he is directing traffic with the players that are on the ice. And these are not players in Swedish juniors. These are Gustafsson, who's 29 years old, who played in the NHL. They're listening to this 18, 19-year-old kid on the bench directing traffic. He's like a little general out there on the bench. And I think that is probably his number one strength. And the offense is second. You know, he's a really good defensive defenseman. That's why the Rangers drafted him. The offense wasn't there in his draft year. They drafted him because he was good defensively and he was a good skater. The offense just came later, and that made him a complete defenseman. And um, if more Thider wasn't playing lights out in the SHL this season, I think Lundqvist would have had a little more support from the, you know, the the, the normal media. But yeah. more Thider, I think. I remember I was at the draft in 2019, more excited being picked sixth overall. Everyone was shocked, but he has he backed it up. Wow. But Nils Lundqvist, uh, don't trade him. Nils Lundqvist is going to be a really good player for this team. And look, look, you're not going to trade Nils Lundqvist because you already have Adam Fox and you already have Jacob Trouba. You know, the Nashville Predators had Matthias Eckholm on their second pair for almost a decade. It doesn't make a second pair defenseman. The Penguins didn't trade Malkin because they already had a first-line center in Crosby. Depth is so important, and that's why I think they should keep Lundqvist. Um, before I, I got to direct this over to Anthony because he's been <laughs> completely quiet this entire time. We haven't gotten any of his questions. But I well, we, can now, but... we can talk about the Islanders, how they gave up uh, Andrew Ladd and some picks, and they got nothing in return, not even a receipt. But before I do that, I have to ask you this. I'm wearing my Alexei Lafreniere jersey right now. Uh, is that a David DeHarnay that you're wearing, or is that Fetter Tutin? No, 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 no. A 51? Oh, even oh. better. Oh. Okay, well, I'm going to get back to him in a minute with you, but first let's get Anthony in on this. Um, well, first, um, nice to formally meet you, Stephen. Um Definitely, uh, definitely know your Rangers. That's for sure. Um, I mean, you want my cut like on Eichel in general, Mark? Is uh, what, what do you want my? Yeah, is any on? question that you might have? You know, you got some. I know. Um, I mean, I, I, I think um, you know, at this point, it's you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty evident that you know, if you believe Elliot Friedman, it's down to the Wild and the uh, the Wild and the Rangers. Um, you know, it's. You know, I, I still don't count out Vegas. I think they're a sneaky team here. Um, you know, they, they pull off some things that some people don't see coming. Um, you know, it seems like every player under the sun they're always in on. They were Mark Stone, Pacioretty, Peter Angelo. They they just find they just find ways to make things work. So, um, you know, if they can, you know, let's say just an example, if they can get Seattle to to take on a player. Um, to free up some cap space, and then they send Alex Tuck in the trade back to Buffalo. Um, they could fit Jack Eichel, and then aside from that, they have pieces like Nicholas Haig. They can give up. Um, you know, they could they could flip Nolan Patrick, uh, Cody Glass, uh, Zach Whitecloud is a pretty good young defenseman for him. Um, so they they have pieces too, and you know, I think if they really want to make it work, they can get Eichel because, um, as John had said, and I agree, they need they need centers that Colin Stevenson can't be your first line center in the playoffs. It's just not going to work. Um, I know Mark Stone took a lot of the blame saying he got totally shut down. Um, and that's true and good on him for owning that. But at the same time, his center was Colin Stevenson. You, you can't, you, you, you can only really do so much when you're playing with a guy like that. So, um, you know, they have uh, Carlson. He's a good number two center. But they need that true number one center if they want to eventually win the cup because it's not going to get done with Stevenson. It's just not. So whether or not Vegas really makes a strong push, that's, that remains to be seen. But um, aside from the Rangers of the Wild, I, I view them as a wild card there. Um, and as far as Minnesota goes, 
Uh, they have Ro Rossi, Rossi and Boldy as two big pieces to put on the table. I, I don't know if they're ultimately going to do it, but um, those, those would be the pieces that they got to send the other way. Um, I don't know if it was uh, who mentioned it before, if it was our buddy Dave Pagnotto or someone else, but um, they mentioned Rossi, Boldy, and, and Matthew Dumba as pieces that would have to go to Buffalo as Dumbo would be for salary reasons. But, um, yeah, it's, it's going to come down to the Warrior. I'd say he's probably going to be traded by, you know, I, I don't know, the day before the draft or on the draft. Um, guys, when Pagnota was on last week, I don't know if you guys – I think he pretty pretty sure he said like around 21st, 22nd, 23rd would be days that, you know, you could see a lot of action. So, um, you know, I, I see those are the days that leads up to a potential Eichel trade. But as far as the Rangers go, I mean – Listen, if they could, if they can get him without trading Lundqvist, um, then good on them. Um, that that would be a big coup for him. But I can't see me personally. I would think Buffalo would want him over guys like Robertson or or Jacks or Zach Jones. I, I do. I think the you know Rangers might have to include him. I get not including obviously Kako, Lafreniere, and all that, but they might have to at least part with Nils Lundqvist. And you know that's the price you have to pay. You have to give to get. So we'll see what yeah. develops. If I can quickly say something, if if the range, I feel that if the Rangers were willing to give up Nils Lundqvist in a four-piece package for Eichel, it, the trade would have been done by now. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of with you there on that. It, it, to me, the biggest thing is I, I had my guidelines, and I'm pretty sure I've, I've said this to all of you guys, is that you've got to find, one, the team that's willing to make that deal, two, it fits their trajectory. Three has the cap space, and then four has the assets to do it. And the amount of teams that realistically fit all four of those parameters is basically just the Rangers. It's just the Rangers. Yeah. yeah I mean, and Boston, they may have cap space now, but where are their assets? Mm -hmm. What do they have to get that deal? Oh, they, they gave up. They gave up all their assets in the past three years. Yeah, exactly. They, they haven't had assets in a long time. No. And, and then you have L.A. I mean, they don't want to give up Byfield. Otherwise, I think if they wanted to give up Byfield, if, if that wasn't the sticking point, L.A. would have pulled off this deal already. Mm -hmm. they, they would have him already. They wouldn't risk it. They wouldn't mess around. And Adams, you know what? Honestly, he said he lowered his asking price. If he lowered his asking price and L.A. was legitimately in on him, don't you think he'd be a king by now? I, I, I just I, I, I have a hard time believing that that teams like LA and Anaheim are really in on it because Anaheim, their two most attractive pieces are off limits. What else are they getting to get that deal done? A third and Comtois? Okay, what else? Mm -hmm. What else is it? What else and this is, is Buffalo? Look, and this is what it comes down to. If the only team the Rangers are up against when it comes to a bidding war is Minas the Minnesota Wild. They can outbid Minnesota without including Kravtsov, Lundqvist, Kaka, or Lafreniere. Yeah. It's, it's because yeah. Matt Dumba, Matt Dumba is a good defenseman. But if, if look, the package we're talking about here, Butchnevich, Hedo, Robertson, first round pick, right? Okay. Butchnevich is the best asset in all these, in every possible trade scenario we've, we've gone over the last four, the last three, four months. Uh, if you look at all the pieces individually that have been realistically available for Buffalo to, to go for, Butch Nevich is, is the best asset that's out there. Yeah, you're talking about three other assets that are part of the trade, but Butch Nevich is a legitimate first-line winger at this point. And he's RFA, they can negotiate with him, they can sign him long-term. This is not a situation like Ryan Strom, where he's already on the contract, there's nothing you can do about it, and a year from now he walks away. Which Nevich, he wants to play in the NHL. He has to sign something. Yeah, it, it's he has to sign something. Yeah. Um, if if you're going up against the Minnesota Wild, we're talking about Matthew Boldy, who's a really good prospect. We're talking about uh, Kuznudinov, maybe Marco Rossi, who I really hope he recovers from what he went through the last year because that guy was was almost dead. He 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 almost passed away from COVID. That's how bad it was. Um, I lived in Austria until two months ago, and it was it was a big story there. His his dad was on the news, telling how Marco Rossi didn't like in the middle of the night asked his dad to stay because he thought he was when he fell asleep he thought he was going to die, and this is an 18 year old kid 
that was drafted in the first round not even three four months before that it's ridiculous so i hope I before okay. the season i know before the season ended he was he was skating again so it looks like yeah. he's got a good he's got a good yeah. prognosis marco rossi no of course, so. but, but you don't know what kind of lasting effects there are i really hope he makes a full recovery but even then you're talking about boldy rossi kusnodinov and, and dumba and minnesota's first round pick i guess the Rangers can the Rangers can match that without including Kako, Lafreniere, Lundqvist, or Kravtsov. Yeah, I, I mean I think Bochnevich alone tips the scales in the Rangers' favor. But exactly. Thing with Minnesota, you're going to have in 2021 or yeah 2022-23, you're mm -hmm. going to have 12 million dollars of dead cap space, and you're going to have a minimal amount of players under contract. Then the next year, the next two years after that, you're going to have $14 million in dead cap and minimal yep. contract. How are you fitting in a $10 million AAV in Jack Eichel? And then you've got to sign, everyone knows him, the probable, the rookie of the year. Kaprizov. Kaprizov, yeah. Him to a deal near $10 million. How are you fitting all these players in when you're... Well, uh, look, if you, if you, look, yeah, sorry, if you include, include Matt Dumba in the trade, that's six million off the books. Yeah, that's six million off, but you still have to field yeah. almost the entire team. That's I know, I know. But a year from now, Victor Rask is, is UFA. He's on the books for four million now. Okay. So that, that's basically the, the cap hit for Eichel. Okay. If you, You'll have to replace that. Though. I know, I know. You would have to replace those players. You would have to. You would need really good players on entry level contracts. And it's and gonna be what? tough. It's gonna be tough for Minnesota. Uh, and and like you said, you, there's there's four factors you need, and one of them is cap space. And, and but here, here's the thing, though, Stephen. You talk about you, you need those players on ELCs. Where are those players on the ELCs if you trade them for Eichel? That's yeah. I don't think they have that many. They don't have the Rangers. The Rangers can trade, and this is this is the thing. The Rangers can trade good prospects. If Matthew Robertson is a Minnesota Wild prospect, he's a top three prospect for them. Uh, Bodie Bro says if the Sabres can't sign Allmark, Georgiev could be added too. Yeah, and yeah I agree with that. that. I don't think. I, I yeah, true, but I don't think that does much for the value. Yeah, I, yeah, it's it's definitely someone you can add to it. Uh, I think they want to offload Georgiev sooner or later because. It was never the intention to have Georgiev on the team for more than two years when he signed that extension. Uh, the future, and that is Shevchukin, and your backup shouldn't be making more than a million and a half, in my opinion. Um, look, the only team they're they're going up against is the Minnesota Wild because all the other teams are pulling out because they're not giving up their their top prospects. And what I said before, if if you take away Lafreniere, Lundqvist, and Kako. The prospects we're left with would be top three prospects on 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 half the teams in the league. So if Buffalo is asking for a top prospect, it doesn't have to be a team's top prospect. The top prospect is, I don't know, it's debatable what they mean by that. I think Matthew Robertson is a really good defenseman. I yeah. think Matthew Robertson is ready to step into the NHL. You know, physically he's ready. He was dominating the WHL. Um, and yeah, it would suck to lose him, but I would rather lose him than the better prospect. And the Rangers don't have a team that takes them to a bidding war where they have to include those better prospects. That's what it comes down to. And the fact that Buffalo is, according to Kevin Adams, lowering their asking price shows you that Buffalo is not going to get what they were expecting. And this, this, this is so similar to 2012 with Rick Nash because... Columbus Blue Jackets fans were expecting Chris Kreider and Ryan McDonough to be part of that package Jake back in 2012. Yeah, Jake they Dillon. thought they were getting Chris Kreider and Ryan McDonough. And this was Chris Kreider coming off that, that lightning start in the playoffs in 2012, you know, before he even played a regular season game. And McDonough, who just had a stellar season when we, 2012 is when we almost won the President's Trophy. Blue yeah. Jackets fans thought they were getting those two and then maybe Callahan and then a first round pick and maybe more. And what they ended up with was Dubinsky, not a bad player. Anisimov, again, not a bad player. Tim Erickson, who at the time was a really good defensive prospect, and the 19th overall pick that they messed up with uh, Kirby Reichel. Even answer, I, I want you to answer that one right there, that question at the bottom. Which one? Very, very, 
I wonder if the Rangers will bring over Lori uh, Pulliam. Oh, pardon me. Uh, the reports are that he signed. Uh, the, the Rangers have not officially announced it yet, I think. Um, but it was announced in Finland. Um, there were posts on Pioneer's Instagram pro profile where he was celebrating the signing. So it's pretty much official that he's under contract now. I think the Rangers, they have two options here with Pai Uniemi. Uh, he's only 21 years old. He's the same age as Philip Hilo, by the way. Um, I think Pai Uniemi has two options. He can uh, he can play in Hartford or he can be loaned to either a Liga team or maybe somewhere else. Uh, he has said in interviews he's done in the Finnish league. He doesn't want to play for any other team in Liga and he, he's done with TPS as well. He's ready for the next step. So I think he's going to come over, start in Hartford next season, um, unless the Rangers find a way to, I don't think they're going to trade him, but find a way to maybe send him out on loan somewhere else. Uh, but I think Pai Uniemi is still a year or two away from making the, uh, the NHL. All right. I have, uh, I hope it's not a two-part question. It's, I think it's a little bit of an easy one. Let's say the Rangers don't get Jack Eichel. They don't invest their assets and they're going to pivot and go elsewhere. Yep. Um, and I've said before, are the answers within? Uh, Where you see, can Morgan Barron step up and be a fourth line center or even possibly jump to a third line? Uh, what's the latest on Carl Hendrickson? Who wins the, the left D job that's going to go presumably next to Mills Lundqvist? Yep. Um, uh, is that going to be our, your boy right there, Rionanen? Um, uh, Jones, or is it going to be in Matthew Robinson? Or someone else. It's I, I have so many questions when it comes to these prospects. Yeah, and and this is this is probably the the part of the rebuild where fans are going to be really disappointed or maybe heartbroken even because there are going to be prospects traded away that that fans get attached to. You know, uh, fans that have been following Matthew Robertson for the last two years, Zach Jones for the last two years, they 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 might be upset when when we trade them. But that's that's just. That you know, that's that, that's what happens in hockey. Um, but if we, I'll, I'll start at the you know at the top when it comes to your question, if we don't get Eichel, I think the Rangers are still fine for the upcoming season with a Zibanejad, Strom, Hedl, uh down the middle with Rooney centering the fourth line. It's not, it's probably not ideal. You you would like to improve that a little bit, but I think the Rangers are going to be a better team. Even if they don't make any more moves, even if the Gu the Goudreau acquisition is is it, they're going to be a better team because you're not going to have the D'Angelo drama, you're not going to have the Panarin saga where he was blackmailed by some Russian mobster where he had to miss like two or three weeks. You're not going to have Zibanejad missing or or playing like crap for six weeks because of COVID. You're not going to have Kako suffering from COVID. Lafreniere, Kako, Fox, Lindgren, Miller, they're all going to be a year older. You're going to basically replace uh, uh, Jack Johnson with Nils Lundqvist. You cannot tell me that's not an improvement. <laughs> um, if Jeff Shurkin stays healthy, that's another one because he suffered some injuries. We have a new coaching staff. Everything points to, even if they don't make any moves, even if they just sign Buchnevich to an extension and this is it. And they basically replace Brett Howden with Kevin Rooney. And they replace whoever is picked by Seattle with Barclay Goudreau. They're going to be a playoff team. Easy. They're going to be a better team than they were last year. Because the number of distractions the Rangers had in one season is something normal teams don't even face in a decade. It's, yeah. it's amazing what they had last year. Go ahead. Um, so so regarding, regarding the prospects... Uh, uh, on left, on defense, on the left side, you have options. Maybe they want to go for uh, an, a veteran guy. Oleksiak is an option. Ryan Suter was bought out, so he's available. Uh, maybe it's not going to be a really sexy signing. Maybe Jake McCabe from Buffalo, who they have a good report on because they played him eight times this season. Uh, and then on Carl Henriksen, he's going to stay in Sweden for one more year because... And I'm going to get very technical, and this is about the transfer agreement the NHL has with the European leagues. But if a player is drafted outside of the first round, and he's uh, 18, 19, or 20 years old, and he signs an entry-level contract and doesn't make the NHL team, 
and he's still under contract in Europe, the European team has the right to claim him for the season. So if the Rangers cannot send him to Hartford because he's under contract with Frölunda, he's not a first-time pick, he's 20 years old, and in that case, he wouldn't be making the team. It's I know it's very technical, but it's... Well, uh, that's, that's actually one of the best things about you. You know all the technical uh, specs. Like yeah, we're like, all uh, the it's, it's a sickness, really, but it's uh, it, it comes in handy sometimes. No, I, I'm with you. The other thing you didn't mention uh, about the team in terms of distractions, and it, not really, I guess, a distraction, but just a kind of a blunder, if you will, was that goalie carousel that we had talked about right before you got on with Shostorkin and, and Georgiev for as long as it went. And you're not going to have a coach that's going to have that 1A, 1B and trying to force Alexander Georgiev to try to fight for Igor's starters minutes. So you're going to have two yeah. goalies that are going to finally be on the same page and they're going to play accordingly. So that's going to be another thing that's going to uh, help the Rangers out going forward. And you're right, just too many distractions and an inexperienced head coach. And I I've said this, I know I've said this to all three of you guys, but that D'Angelo situation, it doesn't escalate with a better coaching, a better coach and a better leap shifter. It doesn't. It just doesn't. Uh, I mean, you can have the worst situation in the world in the locker room. And let's just look at the 94 Rangers. They all hated Mike Keenan. The entire team, Messier included, hated Keenan. That's why Keith Ho was their motto. And what did they do? They rallied around Messier because he was a great leader. And they won the whole damn thing. So, you know what? You got a better leadership group. You can defuse something like that and stop it from blowing up the way that it did. So, yeah. I, I, I agree that the D'Angelo situation was definitely mm -hmm. not something that the team wanted to deal with, especially early on. And then, obviously, that goalie carousel hurt and obviously Mika and everything. Yeah, yeah I, I could see them being possibly a playoff team with with very minimal movement going forward from here, even if they don't get Eichel. Yeah, that, that 94 team, you know, the one story I'll never forget is uh, when he played Alex Kovalev for four minutes as punishment. Yeah. And, Kovalev, and Kovalev thought he was being rewarded. So. <laughs> I, you know, and the other story I'll I'll say that I remember about that, talking about how much the, the team disliked him. Anthony will love this. He called uh, Gwen Healy into his office and said, what's the difference between me and Al Arbor? And Gwen Healy said, four Stanley Cups get out <laughs> that was it so um and uh, i always bring up the drama whenever they're the ranger fans that idolize mike keenan i always have to bring up the drama between game six and game seven biggest game in this franchise history and he was negotiating his way out of town um so i'll never forgive him for that or what uh, about the the leech for Chelios trade leak that keenan orchestrated i mean you you can't he benched leech in the middle of a series to prove a point, like Ziga said, which is another thing, he he basically went to the New York Post and said, hey, publish this story about us possibly trading our best defenseman for Chris Chelios because I want him to play better. Like, who <laughs> does that? If you did that today, you're done. You're done. Yeah. yeah. Look, 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 the, the, the only other thing I'll say about the 94 thing, the 94 season, you know, we all talk about, uh, you know, the trades at the deadline. You know, you, you give up Tony Amante and you get Noonan and, or no, Matto. No, no. Matto and Noonan, you're right. Matto and Noonan, yeah. Awful trade. Awful. But we're never talking about it because we won the cup two weeks later. And there's there's no way of telling if, if with Noonan and Gartner, if we maybe beat the Devils in six or maybe beat the Devils in five and... And maybe sweep the Canucks in the Stanley Cup final because they weren't that good. With all the moves, they were already the best team at the deadline, and they gave up all these players and they got all these fourth liners and third liners, Craig McTavish and, and and stuff. And and they scrape by in the Eastern Conference Finals, and and then they they go to like the final 15 seconds of Game Seven to win the Cup. I'm happy they won the Cup, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean those trades were good trades. The same yeah, way I, I gotta agree, and I still don't forgive them for trading Mike Gartner for Glenn Anderson. Yeah. Still yeah. don't. And and at the same time, the the opposite is true as well. Just because we didn't win a cup in 2015 doesn't mean the Keith Yandel trade was a bad one. It was a it wasn't a bad trade. It just the coach was an idiot and decided not to 
use the guy on power play one that's, that we brought yeah. in for power play one. Yeah, that, that's a different discussion. I mean, the, the trade was a good trade, and uh, yeah, we just didn't win it. But the ninety four, the ninety four season, oh, and uh, yeah, there's there's just so much wrong with that season. Uh, I remember like the first or second game when they lost to the my, the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, and they were like uh, like the one year in the league. Oh. Yeah, but and, you know, and, it, and the year before that, they lost to uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, Chris yeah. Pontos, the former Ranger draft pick, had a huge goal. Yeah. So, but you know, it's uh, it's I, I cannot believe that's that's twenty seven years now, twenty seven years ago. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. Long, yeah. Long. Still, I still remember where I was. I was awake and uh, sort of like Anthony for hoping. He's, we didn't, we're not losing him right now. <laughs> so in, in, in 94, I was nine years old. I was living in the Netherlands, so I wasn't watching the games live because they start at 1 a.m. Uh, I wasn't allowed to, and I thank my parents for not keeping me up until 4 at 9. Um, but I, I would always read about it the next day or watch it on um, uh, Eurosport, it's like a sports channel here in Europe, and they would show highlights. And my dad would always go to the American bookstore on Mondays and buy the New York Post because at the time, I think they had like a weekly recap of all the sports teams. And that's how I kept up to date on the Rangers. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, Rich is back too. Uh, it's hard of everybody saying, look at the shiny new $10 million toy. Adding Jamie Alexiak, Nils Lundqvist, Coach Gallant, and Bruce Kako and Kratzoff. You know what? Um, actually, that's a great question. Which one of the, the, the of the big rookies do you think is going to prove the most next year on the Gerard Gallant? Oh, uh, look, I'm happy that we have Gerard Gallant because in Florida he worked with uh, Barkov, Trocek, and Huberto when they were 19, 20, 21 years old. In Vegas, that first season with Alex Tuck and uh, uh, William Carlson did amazing things there. I think I think these young guys are going to prosper under Gallant because he's going to let them let them figure it out instead of uh, instead of what David Quinn did. And Ryan, I don't know if you heard the Ryan Spooner interview he did a couple of weeks ago. Um, and just because he didn't he didn't succeed with the Rangers doesn't mean I'm going to ignore his comments on the coaching. What he said about David Quinn is that David Quinn was always pushing, pushing, pushing to dump the puck and to forecheck. Where even when there was a better option available and players mm. would just look at each other on the bench like, why are we dumping the puck? And um, I think Gerard Gallant is, has a much more open approach, which is really going to benefit, especially Lafreniere. Lafreniere is the best prospect the Rangers ever drafted. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. We never drafted first overall until last year. Lafreniere is, is the best prospect we, we ever drafted. Will he be the best player that ever played for us? Remains to be seen, but... At 19, 20 years old, he's the best prospect we ever had on our team. Because, as you know, Brian Leach was still in college at that age. So, uh, I think Lafreniere is going to really shine under Gallant. I think Kako, if he can make another step, uh, he made a really, really progress uh, this past season on the defensive side of the puck. If he can add that offense this upcoming season, uh, he, he's going to, I think both have the potential to hit 50 points. Definitely. Here's the thing with me, with Kako. Uh, you, I mean, you know me as well. You guys all know I was very, very high on Kako. The one thing that I saw from Kako this past year that really, like, changed everything with him was confidence. And the coach was a confidence killer. I mean, Quinn, that game against Calgary, he has those two goals, brilliant goals, and then he, he gets called for that borderline BS penalty. And Quinn sits him for the rest of the damn game. How are you going to do that when the guy has a career game as a rookie like that? He's finally starting to turn a corner. He mm -hmm. killed his confidence. But this year, he came back. Every shift, he was a difference maker. The play-in series, he, every shift that he was out there. He was their best forward. He was probably their best player in that yeah. play, if not Ryan Lindgren. And then, you know what? Honestly, he comes out this year. The defense is 10 times better. The eye test shows you it. The analytics show you it. Top 30 in the league in takeaways. The only thing that's missing was really his shot. He's yeah. just still a little indecisive on when he wants to take that shot. He's passing up shots that he was taking in international play and in mm -hmm. league and so on. So and it, when that's confidence. Shot, it all comes down to confidence. 
Yeah, it's confidence. It's confidence. And you know what? Honestly, I think if that shot improves, I think he's going to be an absolute nightmare for teams. Look, look, the the the, the best moment of Kako's season, I'm, I'm torn between uh, that takeaway he had when he came out of the penalty box against the Capitals when he was called for that embellishment, which was ridiculous, or that goal he scored on a two-on-one breakaway with Lafreniere, where Lafreniere passes him the puck and instead of shooting, he pulls it back, moves it around the goalie and taps it in. I think, oh, and he had some really brilliant moments, and that's when you see the talent of Capo Kako. And he was a second overall pick for a reason. Let's not kid ourselves. We didn't reach for a player that shouldn't have been there. Uh, two years in a row, we draft the consensus pick. Second overall, Capo Kako. First overall, Alexi Lafreniere. And both are struggling on the same team, under the same coaching staff. Yeah, that's not a coincidence, man. That's It's, it's not on the players in that case. And we've had Julian Gauthier, who, for whatever reason, was, was punished every time a, a puck bounced off his stick. Um, Kraftsoff had his issues, of course. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Spooner was was very very open about his experience. If you have in in, a, in an eighteen month span five six players who come out and criticize you, you have a problem. And I think I think Quinn's time as a Rangers coach was done uh, when Knoblock was behind the bench for the three weeks. Uh, I think that was the final nail in the coffin. And Quinn was better after that, you know. He he changed his approach a little bit, I feel, in the uh, in the final games of the season. But I think by then it was done. Um, and now they go to a coach that has experience working with young players. And this is my biggest gripe with David Quinn, who is actually a really nice guy. I met him at the draft in 2019. But everyone always talks about Quinn being a development coach. But he was coaching Boston University in college, a team that always has the best recruits. He had Jack Eichel, uh, Clayton Keller, Dante Fabro, Brady Kachuk, uh, and I can go on and on and on. He wasn't he wasn't the type of coach that turns players into performers. No, he was given performance because their recruiting system is so great. If you want to go into college and hire a good development coach, you have to look at teams like UMass, UMass Lowell, uh, Minnesota Duluth, uh, Providence, the Providence Friars with Brett Burrard, those are coaches that have turned undrafted players, seventh round picks, sixth round picks into NHLers. Those are the coaches you want if you're going for a development coach. And this is not, not nothing personal against David Quinn, but he was coaching the number one team in college in terms of upside, and he never won anything. I, I never understood the hiring from day one, and uh, yeah. It's it's weird that we never had a, a captain under Quinn uh, either. Yeah, that's if still something that, that that bothers me a lot too. Um, actually, because uh, we're gonna actually uh, get you out on this, or you're welcome to stay if you want to join us in the other segments. Um, uh, do, do you think there's an under the radar trade that that we're not uh, seeing at all? Um, Look, it's it's really difficult to pinpoint trades because there's 31 other teams in the league. You never know what's going to happen. Um, but the fact that they spoke to Tampa, maybe there's something there. If if by some chance Yanni Gord is not picked by Seattle, which I doubt because he's easily their best player available in the expansion draft, I, I could see a trade with Tampa if 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 Yanni Gord is still in Tampa because Tampa still needs to clear like 10 million in salary. Wow. All right. If, if the Rangers do not go for Jack Eichel, then you might as well use that cap space as an asset and get a guy short term that makes you better for the next one or two years and then walks as a free agent or you trade him at the deadline, whatever, instead of going into the season with six or seven million cap space. That would be that would be foolish. All right. Um yeah, because it because actually in Mike's advantage draft, uh, I had Palat that was that wasn't protected. So. Uh, Pilat isn't protected either. No, there are some. When it comes to the expansion drafts, there are some really weird choices. The Nashville Predators going three five one with their with their protection list, only protecting yeah. three forwards, and the third one nobody has ever heard of uh, outside of Nashville. Uh, so yeah, it's it's interesting for Seattle what's going to happen. They have so many options. When you look at Tampa, Tyler Johnson, Alex Killorn, uh, Andre Pilat, and Yanni Gord four forwards that they could choose from. I'd probably go with Yanni Gord, but maybe 
maybe Seattle is uh, uh, maybe Seattle is is a team that acquires Yanni Gord and then trades him for something. I mean, maybe maybe Seattle turns around and says, "Hey, I'll, I'll take your 15th overall pick for Yanni Gord." Well, again, uh, like, uh, do you want to stick around with us for for the next segment? Yeah, sure, sure. I, I did see a question from one from someone in the, on the screen actually. Now, which think- one? Uh, I'm a Rangers fan. Oh, that's that's fine. I've heard this story before, but yeah, definitely call it. Uh, All right. So, uh, I'll, I'll try to be quick, but uh, I grew up in the Netherlands, born and raised. <laughs> early '90s, uh, my parents were going through a divorce. They were fighting every every time. So every day when I got home from work, um, I just turned on the TV and I watched some TV. And Eurosport, uh, the channel I mentioned previously, they were showing NHL highlights, and this was like 91, 92. And um, I, I started watching highlights, and I thought, oh, this is fun. Ice hockey, as they call it in Europe. This is fun. And, um, you know, as a kid, you pick a team. Uh, one of my friends was watching highlights with me. He picked the Flyers because they play in orange, which is the national color of the Netherlands. But I decided to go with the New York Rangers, and uh, it's a weird reason, but... At the time, uh, I thought the New York Rangers were different from every other team in the league because they were the only team that didn't have a logo on their jersey because of the diagonal lettering. I thought that was special, and that's how I became a Rangers fan. And, uh, yeah, I've been following them ever since. Uh, Early 2000s, started streaming games, shitty quality, ad blockers everywhere. and then you slowly get into it, and then you have like NHL Network and NHL TV. Uh, 2016, I made my way to New York for the first time to see a game. Um, we beat the Edmonton Oilers 5-3 at the Garden. Rick Nash scoring the game-winning goal. And uh, yeah, I've been to the Winter Classic in 2018, where I met my fiance. So she'll probably be happy if I mention that. Nice. Um, <laughs> And, and in 2017, I moved to Vienna for a new job, and that job allowed me to travel a lot. So I um, started traveling around, uh, had some work trips to Sweden and Finland several times a year, and I tried to combine that with some hockey games. And it was around the same time where the Rangers were really steering towards drafting from Europe. Guys like Payo Niemi, Reunanen, Lundqvist, Kravtsov. Uh, I, I remember being a little bit disappointed that Hedl was going to Hartford and not going back to the Czech Republic, but... What can you do? Um, yeah, and then I just started following those prospects and uh, going to under-18 tournaments, under-20 tournaments. And some of these tournaments, there's like 100 people in the stands and 75 are NHL scouts. Like the under-24 nations tournament with the Czech Republic, Russia, Sweden, and Finland. They're so much fun to attend because you can just walk up to a player after the game and just ask for a picture or have him sign a puck. Or you can have like a 10-minute conversation. And uh, I've I've... I've met players' families. Um, uh, Vitaly Kravtsov's sister and, 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 and dad recognized me in Vancouver from a previous tournament. Nils Lundqvist's grandpa follows me, uh, is, is one of my Facebook friends. Um, you know, and you just, you just you, you start to interact with them. And, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. I went to the 2019 draft when we drafted Kako, and he recognized me from a previous tournament. And uh, he asked his dad to take a picture of me and him with his phone. So that's pretty cool. That's but you know, it's, a, it's a hobby that's gotten out of hand a little bit, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. It's working out pretty well. Yeah. All right. Well, that was our exclusive conversation with Stat Boy Steven of Wardy NHL. Uh, you can catch him over there on their channel. We'll, uh, we'll love to have Tyler on sometime as well. Um, if you like all this stuff right here, like share and subscribe. Did you like the video? Of course you did. So why not check out some more of our content? You can check the playlist right here or right here. Your ideas are intriguing to me, and I wish to subscribe to your newsletter.